Lau. Hello. Is it audible? Okay. Wait one more minute and we'll start again. Okay, first I want to apologize. I, at the end, I, I rushed a little bit through freeness. Freeness is a very complicated uh, concept, but I think there'll be a lot of talk about freeness in the, in the school. I think Camille, for instance, will, um, will, will talk about it. Uh, I'll also talk again about freeness uh, today. Okay, so today I want to talk about three things. Um, so this is kind of the second introductory lecture. And um, I want to talk about sample covariance matrices. So estimating covariances from, from real data, but from a, from a theoretical point of view. And this, will, this was actually studied by uh, in the large end limit, well, it was studied in the in a small end limit, and for for, for finite side matrices by Wishart. This is why we'll, the, the 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 matrices will be um, in in at the beginning of the twentieth century, I think nineteen twenty, just something like that. I don't know the date exactly. So Wishart studied uh, small sample covariance matrices, and then Marchenko and Pasteur in sixty seven studied the large end limit of, of these matrices. Um, and then the, the more modern formulation is using uh, multiplicative uh, free convolution. Uh, so I'll explain what that is. Okay. Uh, just a little uh, note, um, Marcinko and Pasteur, which uh, I'm going to talk about their work uh, today, they're Ukrainian uh, uh, mathematician. Um, Pasteur is about 80 years old. He just w moved to Ecole Normale because of the war. And uh, um, miraculously, Marchenko is still alive. He's like 99 years old. I've, I've heard he's now in Canada safe from the war. But <laughs> So I was always wondering if Marchenko was still alive because he was born in 1922. Um, anyway, but he, but he is. Um, but I don't think he's very active anymore. Uh, okay, so um, sample covariance matrices. So I want to, I, I, um, and I want to tell you how, how large sample covariance matrices are, are interesting. So. So what's, what's uh, well, first, maybe I mean, let's assume that I have some data uh, that drawn from a matrix uh, uh, from covariance C. Okay? Maybe to make things simpler, you can think of Gaussian IID data uh, drawn from a, a covariance matrix, but you don't have access to this matrix. What you have access to is a sample. So the sample let me call it H. So H will be a rectangular matrix, uh, which sometimes I will denote XIT. Okay, so, so this is a variable i at time t. So I, I, have, um, at, I have multiple times, so I'll have t. So I have t slices of my data, which, uh, which I assume to be each column, each time is iid. And then uh, the, the col the, what I'm, my data is actually a vector and the vector xi as actually a covariance, uh, a, a true covariance C that I, that I typically don't know, okay? Or, um, and I'm gonna, uh, so this, 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 this data XIT, I'm gonna put in the matrix H, which is gonna be N by T. Okay, so I, I have N variables and T observation. 
be careful, often mathematicians will use p variables and little n observation. Okay, but uh, my notation is n, so I, I, my, my matrices are always capital N by capital N, okay? But, but very often, if you look at sample covariance matrices, there'll be p by p matrices. Um, because it's uh, really also to the number of degrees of freedom and, and so on, so they use P, but uh, I'll, be, I'll be using T for the observations and, um, and N for the variables. Okay, so what is it? And I'll use this uh, E for empirical. So I, I'll define the, the, the matrix P, uh, just, uh, if, you, if you wanted to compute a, a, a covariance matrix from data, you would say one over the number of, of samples, uh, some uh, T goes from one to big T, of xi at time t, xj at time t. This is how you build a, uh, a covariance matrix. And here I assume that either you've already subtracted the mean or the mean don't matter, or you don't know the mean. So I, I'll, I'll never worry about the, the, the expectation of the variable x. So, so let's just assume that the, you know a priori that they have zero expectation, for instance, okay? And this uh, you could write as a matrix product. So it's easier to write as it's h, h transpose over t. Okay, so here T is transpose and here T is the number of, uh, of observation, okay? So, so this is an N by T matrix. So th this is a rectangular matrix, huh? so it's very important. So this is a rectangular matrix N by T, the transpose is T by N. So this the result, the sample covariance matrix E, or this is actually a matrix element, so the matrix E itself, I write as, uh, as this product. Okay, so what can we say about this matrix E? Well, one thing, um, the, that if T is finite, no, sorry. If N is finite, okay, say you have three variables, okay, and T goes to infinity. Well, then E converges to C and there's nothing more to say, the class is over, okay? But, uh, but this is not the limit that interests us. Okay, so this is this, this is this is this is what I would call classical statistics. In classical statistics, you don't work if you have thousands of observation and, and three by three or five by five matrices. You don't worry about estimation error of your covariance, and um, and all I'm going to say is irrelevant. The the interesting limit is when the number of limit of uh, variables is large, uh, and, and by large I mean large compared to the the observations. So I was interested in this problem because in finance, uh, especially in quantitative finance, you often have very large portfolios, say hundreds of like 500 stocks in the S&P 500 or 3000 stocks in, in the Russell index. So typical people deal with portfolios with thousands of stocks and they, they need to measure covariance matrices using daily data. And say 1000 business days is four, uh, is four years of data. So if you use, eight years of data, you have 2000 business days. And if you have 2000 stocks, you really have about the same, well, you, you literally have about the same number of observation as variables. And then we're very, very far from this limit of n finite t goes to infinity. So saying that E converges to C is, is very, very wrong. So this is what I'm gonna to try to convince you today that in this limit, E does not converge to C. E is something else, it has interesting properties. And we're gonna study the properties of, of the sample covariance matrix E. Okay, so what can we say? So let's, before having a model, let's just say that we have some data H. So H could be anything. It, it could be uh, non-stationary. It could be random. It could be all, have all sorts of randomness that, 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 that I don't care about. It's just some, some, some uh, rectangular matrix of data uh, for as long as the label, the, 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 um, the rows, uh, the rows make sense. Uh, then I can compute a sample covariance matrix of the rows. And so, which would be E equals one over T H H transpose. Okay. And some, some basic things you can, I can say about this. Well, first of all, it might have zero eigenvalues. Okay. And it often has uh, uh, zero eigenvalues. And to see this, I'm going to consider, actually, I'm going to forget for a moment because I'm, if I only consider zero eigenvalues, the normalization one over T doesn't matter. And it's simpler to, to ignore it. I'm going to consider matrix H, H transpose and H transpose H. Okay. So these look very similar uh, matrices, but they're, they're completely different objects. This is an N by N matrix, and this is T by T. Okay. But you can show, I, I won't do it here, it, it takes uh, three minutes to show that the, if, if this matrix has a non-zero eigenvalue, 
then this one will have the same non-zero eigenvalue. They, they, they share the same non-zero eigenvalue. Okay. Um, and so given that they're not the same size, um, and, and they're, by, by, by the way, they're, they're symmetric and positive definite. So they can be diagonalized and all the eigenvalues are positive or zero. Okay. So if you have two matrices with, that are not the same size and, um, and they share the same non-zero eigenvalues, it means that the only difference could be in the zero eigenvalues. So for instance, typically we'll be dealing with the case where T is greater than N, okay? And in that case, you know that at least T minus N eigenvalues are zero in this case, okay? But you could have cases where N is greater than T and then, it, then it's on this side, okay? Uh, so if T is greater than N, I have the same non-zero, therefore I need to have quite a few um, zero eigenvalue. And for instance, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's an interesting case. Already, okay, now I go back to sort of a sample covariance matrix that I'm trying to estimate from real data, that if I'm in the case where N is smaller than T, then my, my E must have zero eigenvalues. Well, eigenvalues equals to zero. Okay, and, and then the number is at at least T minus N. So, so my matrix C, I could assume it full rank it as a non-zero and I cannot, so for already you see that, that, that the matrix E is not a faithful representation of, of C because if I'm in this limit, which is uh, pretty sick, I have, sorry, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. Okay, the limit where I have more variables than observation if I have more variable of, there are many ways of seeing it. I, I like to see it this way, but there are many ways. You could also see that, uh, well, anyway, that the, linear, the system of linear equation um, is, is, um, is incomplete and therefore you, they must have zero, have zero eigenvalues. Anyway, so uh, if N is greater than T, if T is too small, then definitely E has zero eigenvalues where I could postulate C doesn't have zero eigenvalues. And, and so, so our hints as the fact that the matrix E is, is not a faithful, doesn't converge to, to C. Another thing I could do that's also fairly easy where I don't really need a random matrix theory is to compute the moments. Uh, so remember the moment, moment operator, uh, which, um, which is one over N trace of a, so T of, of some matrix M is one over N trace of the matrix. And, and this typically uh, in most cases uh, becomes self-averaging and, uh, um, but I could, I could add an expectation value, okay? So in expectation value, actually, in this setup, the expectation value of E is indeed the C. Um, and so this trace operator is linear. So I, I do have that the trace of E is equal to the normalized trace of C. So the first moment match, but it's a, it's a relatively easy computation to see that already the second moment they don't match anymore. So that I have that trace of, this is, I'm taking here, maybe I should be more precise. I'm taking the, the n goes to infinity limit with a number q, which is n over t fixed. Okay, so I'm taking a limit where both n and t go to infinity, but the ratio is, is fixed. So again, in my, my setup for, for stocks, suppose that I have, um, uh, twice as many days than I have stocks. Okay, so, um, so Q equals a half, but then I let the number of days go to infinity and the number of stocks go to infinity. And I study the properties of, of these matrices. Uh, and then in that limit, you can compute the second moment. Okay, so basically I'm, I'm dropping terms in, in what, that are negligible as N goes to infinity. And I get that T of E square, the second moment is equal to the second moment of C plus an extra term Q uh, trace of C or tau, normalized trace of C squared, okay? So remember the, the, this, this limit here, n finite goes to infinity, T goes to infinity is since Q is N over T is the limit Q goes to zero. So the limit Q goes to zero, you get uh, normal statistics and you can show actually that in this limit, the moments match. So when Q goes to zero, when, when N is fixed and T goes to infinity, this term disappears 
and you have that the 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 second moment of the distribution match and actually all moments of the distribution match and again we're back to this uh that that e has actually converged to c and there's really nothing interesting to say uh about the matrix e but in the in, in the general case and this limit here when n is greater than t is when q is greater than one okay so because q again is n over t so if n is greater than t that's greater than one. okay so just in so we'll have essentially um we'll have q equals zero which is uh, the sort of classical statistics and then we'll have an interesting regime from q between zero and one and then q greater than or equal to one you will have zero eigenvalues you can still say you can still quantify what happens uh but in the q greater than one the the e will will start to have zero eigenvalues and uh somebody asked me in the steel just transform when you have a finite number of uh, eigenvalues or certain values so in this case we'll have a finite fraction of zero eigenvalues we'll actually have a a a pole in in the uh the steel just transform or a dirac delta in the density okay so uh but but i'll mostly concentrate on in this case that's more typical where q is is um, where we have enough enough data, we have more data than than, than variables, but not that ma that much more. So Q is between zero and one. Okay. Okay. So um, can I say more things about the matrix E? Well, first, before the, doing that, I need a, a model of my data. Okay. So how do I model uh, data with a fixed covariance matrix? Well. If you if you were to make a computer program to generate correlated data, in many ways you could do it. Uh, you, you it's easy to to generate IID data. So you just say, generate um, IID uh, columns and then you correlate the columns. And one way to do that is you could say work in the eigenbase, for instance, and uh, and multiply and then the variance of uh, if you're in the eigenbase, the variance is the square root of the of the um, the, 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 the standard deviation is the square root of the eigenvalues. And so you can, you can generate data in the eigenbase with, with, uh, with standard deviation equals to square root of lambda, and then go back to the physical base. That's one way of doing it. There are many ways of doing it, but they all amount essentially to doing a square root of, um, of the, so I have, I have my covariance matrix C. So if I want to generate data with covariance matrix C, what I'm telling you, if you generate if you some sort of matrix matrix square root, and the matrix square root you can think of, you diagonalize C, you take the square root of the eigenvalues, and you go back in the physical space. If you look at this combination, uh, so H0 is IID data. So H0 is N by T, IID, uh, normal 0, 1, for instance. Okay, so you first you first generate a white data, and then you multiply to the left by square root of c, and then this will give you correlated data. So I'm saying that I'm a model. This is a model for correlated data, and, and, and again, in real life, there are many many complex, complex uh, things that can uh, happen. But if I if I want to have multivariate stationary, by stationary I mean the covariance is the same for all the columns. Um, and then multivariate Gaussian, it's not necessary, but just makes life easier to uh, uh, at this introductory level. Just think of everything as multivariate Gaussian. It doesn't need to be because in large end limit, as long as variance exists, it, it's enough. But anyway, in this case, we'll think of a multivariate Gaussian with a covariance C, then you can build it this way. And there are many ways to prove that this is the case, but just if you look at expectation value of one over T H H transpose, you can quickly convince yourself that this is uh, C. Okay, so that, that your data, and this is true for every column. So this, this is a multiplication to the left, so it mu multiplies every column. So every column of H has covariance C, okay? And it's IID on the time axis. So uh, again, I, I like the finance analogy. It's, it's like saying that every day you get a different sample, but of correlated variable. And, and this is what, okay. Okay, so now I'm building. So uh, now I can say that E is really the same thing as square root of C. 
H0, H0 transpose uh, square root of C, and then I need a over T for the normalization. Okay, so, so this is my model of the data. Um, and, 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 and I could try to study the, the eigenvalue distribution of, of this. Okay, now remember Mark, that. Mark, sorry to, yeah. to interrupt you. A question on the chat. So, on a physical note, why are we actually interested? Uh, by the eigenvalues of covariance matrices in applications and um, physics. That will, will, uh, I'll give examples on uh, Wednesday. Uh, okay. on, on Wednesday, I'll show financial applications. Why? Well, but we we actually not necessarily uh, interested in the, in the eigenvalues per se. But we need to characterize this matrix, and 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 the um, and the eigenvalue uh, gives us a, a lot of information. And for instance, I also, I mean, this is uh, my, my series of lectures about eigenvectors as well. So I'll also, but I'll first, I need to start with the eigenvalues. First, I understand the eigenvalues and then I can understand the eigenvectors. And then when I want to build, when I want, the, the whole point, and there will be the lectures on, the two lectures on Wednesday, will be estimating C given E. But today we're, so it's, 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 today we're doing the forward problem. We're given C, what's the consequence for E? But the inference problem is more interesting. The inference problem will be uh, we're given E and we want to infer C. And essentially, we, if we can infer the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, we can re reconstruct the matrix. So that's kind of the, the argument. And another reason you want to know about eigenvalues because uh, when you invert, very often you need to invert a matrix. And if it has small, uh, small noisy eigenvalues, inverting a matrix with small noisy eigenvalues is super dangerous. So knowing that there are small noisy eigenvalues is important. Okay, so again, so this I can do, uh, yes. So this I can do with free probability theory, but I won't use free probability theory right now. And therefore I'll use, I'll do something slightly different, which is equivalent, but it's a bit cumbersome to, to go from one to the other. As I told you, uh, H, H transpose and H transpose H have the same eigenvalues, except they're different size matrices. And so, so this is an N by N, this is T by T, and the normalization are slightly different. But anyway, let me compute just this. It's going to be slightly easier is to do this object, H, um, H0, well, let me define, let me just this object. So, so this object is, is a bit different where C is on in the, in the inside or where C here is on the outside. In terms of eigenvalue, as I said, it really doesn't matter. It's just a question of, of keeping track of the zeros eigenvalues and, and the, the proper normalization. But this, 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 is, this computation is easier to do. And this is actually what Marcin and Pasteur studied. Okay. And if you think, well, since H is rotationally invariant, um, you can actually, it doesn't matter, uh, you can choose C to be diagonal. If you choose C to be diagonal, then it's like studying data where the variance changes every day. You have an IID vector, but it, the scale fluctuates. So it's something that happens in finance. It's called volatility. You have on, on, on the, uh, different days, you might have a, a, a day where things move a lot. It's a big, uh, uh, correspond to a big uh, value for C um, and days where things don't move much or a small value for C. So think of measuring IID vectors in a, in a fluctuating variance way, okay? So, um, and this I'll write actually as a sum. So I'll write one over T, sum over T of XIT, XJT, where X are IID, but then I have this C, which I'll, I'll, I'll say that the eigenvalues of C are sigma square at time T, okay? And, I, I, and the order doesn't matter, so I can even rank them, okay? So the, the matrix C, I can diagonalize it because it's a rotation invariant. I could also rank, okay? So, so uh, sigma square of zero, would, uh, sigma square of one would be the smallest eigenvalue of C, and sigma square of big T would be the largest eigenvalue of C. And this is equivalent to the sum. And here, the I's are IID uh, variables, okay? Uh, what, what's nice about this form, the, this, here, well, I'm going to put the one over T here. Okay. This object is a, is a rank one matrix. It's a rank one matrix. Um, and so it has a single eigenvalue, non-zero, and all the other eigenvalues are zero. So I can really write it as 
sum over t as some projector. Okay. And the projector t is, well, just, uh, just redefine projector t as x, well, it's basically vector x, uh, t, x, t transpose, and then some normalization sigma square over t. Okay, so I have a, I have a projector that would, uh, well, uh, and this is a this is a, a vector of size n. Okay, and in my normalization, given the, the um, that the x's are iid with variance one, this this object is variance n. Okay, so um, and so you can convince yourself that this has two two eigen as one eigenvalue, and in the large n limit, this is a, this, this the 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 norm of this vector doesn't fluctuate. In the large n limit, the this is um, the sum of the squares of this. There's n, n, n component. So it's a sum of n positive number. It doesn't fluctuate. But large, large, large number, this doesn't fluctuate. So I have one eigenvalue equals to n over t sigma squared t. And I have n minus one eigenvalue that are all equal to zero. Okay. So this is a pro that's why I call it the projector. Projector, well, this is a projector in a one dimensional space, but has a single eigen. Uh, and on top of that, not only it's a projector, it's rotation invariant. So here I've written my matrix E as a sum of rotation invariant matrices. And so I can use the freeness that I sort of rushed at the last lecture um, to say that I can compute the spectrum of E because I can compute the R transform of E. The R transform, if they evaluate at some point G, will be equal to the sum over T of the R transform of each of these. Uh, these matrices, okay? So I have a sum of matrices, they're rotation invariant. So I have this property that the R transform is additive. It's additive two by two, but, but since each of these is, is rotation invariant, I can add another one, add another one, add another one. And so it's additive all the way for, so I have, I'm adding, um, I'm adding T, large capital, large T um, rotation invariant matrices. So, I can, so if I can compute the R transform of this object, I'll be able to compute the R transform of, of the sample covariance matrix. And again, the R transform is related to the Stilgis transform. So I can invert the Stilgis transform and get and take the imaginary part on the real axis and get the density. So this is how, this is how we go. This is not how much of a tour did it because they didn't know about the R transform, but I'll, I'll get the same result as they did. Okay. So, what, so to get the R transform of this object, I need to, um, to basically the R the, I need to compute the Stilgis transform. So I, I'm gonna put a little T because this explicitly depends on this variance sigma T, okay? And what is it? Well, I have, uh, it's, it's one over N and then I have one over this eigenvalue Z minus uh, well, this is Q, by the way. Okay, so I want Q sigma squared, sigma T squared. And then I have N minus one other eigenvalues that are all equal to zero. Okay, so this is a, this is the, um, this is a Stilgis transform of a projector. Uh, exactly. So normally, I'm, I'm sort of cheating here because normally, um, the R transform is only defined, defined in the large N limit. So I'm, uh, I should only keep the terms that are finite as N goes to infinity. So as N goes to infinity, the, 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 the Stilgis transform of a projector is just one over Z, okay? Which is the same as a, uh, the, uh, the Stilgis transform of the, of the zero matrix, okay? And the R transform associated with this, okay? Uh, so I can, so this is G, so again, if I only keep the terms that are, so this, this disappears one over N and this minus one also disappears as one over N. The only thing that matters is one over Z. I can invert this relationship. I get Z of G equals one over G and the R transform is Z of G minus one over G. So the R transform is zero, okay? So I've lost everything. I, 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 get, I get a sum of zeros, okay? So I'm gonna cheat. Uh, because I'm not a mathematician, I'm allowed to cheat. Um, uh, I'm going to say, well, because I have a large sum here, maybe I should keep my R transform to first order in one over N because T is large. So I'll have N terms. So if I compute the R transform to order one over N, then 
uh, then the R transform won't be zero, it'll be, it'll be something. And then I can sum, um, uh, I, I can sum T of these things and, and get the, the correct result, okay? So, so I see time is going by, so I'm just gonna state the result. Okay, so it's fairly easy. Um, just to, to give you the gist of it. So basically I'm gonna do it iteratively. So I'm gonna write G of Z as a term to first or to a zero order plus a correction in one over N. And then I'm gonna invert, I'm gonna invert this uh, to first order in one over N. And, and then remove the pole at one over G that's still there and get the, 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 the R transform. And then I'm gonna sum over T. So if I'm not mistaken, I get something like this, R of, of G equals sum, I'm gonna one over N, the T equals one to T and then right, because otherwise I'll get, to, but it was, um, it was Q sigma it doesn't really matter exactly what it is, but one minus uh, G Q sigma squared T. Okay. Um, and and in the large n limit, I could I could I could sort the eigenvalues of this matrix C, and and they become continuous, and and sort of say that sigma squared. T becomes a function sigma squared of T between zero and one. Okay, so and, and replace this sum by an integral. This is a sum over T, I have a one over N. So there's a factor of Q that will, that will appear, I would cancel this factor of Q. And trust me, the answer would be to go zero to one DT uh, of sigma squared now of T, I have a, now a function, one minus G uh, Q uh, sigma squared of T. Okay, and this is the R transform. Okay, so uh, two things you can jump at. Well, maybe uh, I was too ambitious to, uh, to deal with the case where there's a matrix C. Okay, so if C is that entity, if C is that entity, all its eigenvalues are one, these sigma squares, they're all one, this integral of one uh, just simplifies tremendously. And this is called the white case. So it's called a white Wishart. So, so the sample covariance matrix is a Wishart matrix. Uh, Wishart actually considered the matrix C. So if you don't have a matrix C, then it's called, uh, the, it's, it's a Wishart matrix with the identity co true covariance. And then I call that a white Wishart. And then you have that the R transform is very simple. Uh, evaluated point uh, G is equal to one over um, one minus QG. Okay, so that, that's one result that we get here. It was just, it's like doing the same computation without bothering with the sigma square terms, okay? And then another thing you could do is rewrite, because this is the R transform, but the R transform is directly related to the steel just, the inverse steel just transform uh, minus one over G. And if you write it like this, and and you say, this is an implicit equation for G, okay? Uh, and, and you can just write like that instead, G of Z, G of Z, okay? So this equation here written like that, this is essentially what Martian Point Pasteur got in their paper in 67, okay? They related the steel just transform of a matrix of that type to in an implicit equation that, that that's, that's the Martian Copas Tour equation, that's is a bit hard to solve, but you could solve it, uh, uh, well, the, the methods to solve it numerically. And it relates the steel just transform uh, with itself, uh, with this integral that depends on the, um, on the density. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. And, okay. And, and so this is a bit cumbersome and, and it's particular to, um, to sample covariance matrices. And so I just wanna finish the last five minutes um, with something a bit more general in this, uh, having to do with, because um, really the, these, these objects, uh, 
go, I'll go back to the, the previous object, E equals square root of C uh, H zero, H zero transpose over T square root of C. This is really a product of the matrix W. Okay, so I'm gonna find a white Wishart, W zero if you want, is just this matrix. Okay, this, this is, this is, okay, if you want, this is a sample covariance matrix of, of white noise, the sample covariance matrix of data that uncorrelated, okay? And it has the R transform that is equal to this, okay? By the way, I, I, um, I won't have time to, you can invert this, you get a quadratic equation for G, you can easily solve the quadratic equation, you get a branch cut, and just run a write it at least, that the density of eigenvalues that you get for something like this, just go right, it's called the, it's also called the Martian Kopestor density. Again, Martian Kopestor density is for the white Wishart. Okay, for the, if you want the colored Wishart, the one with the matrix C in, in the middle or the matrix C on the side uh, is, is an integral equation. But for a white Wishart, it's a simple equation and it's rho of lambda uh, is gonna be, uh, square root of lambda plus minus lambda times lambda minus lambda minus over uh, two pi uh, lambda and with lambda plus or minus that depend on Q by this formula. And what it looks like, it's a very small graph, but it looks something like this. Okay, it goes from lambda minus to lambda plus. And so if, if Q is between zero and one, um, this is between zero and four, okay? So lambda minus is between, um, is between zero and one, and lambda plus is between one and four, okay? Uh, uh, so, um, and, and it depends on Q. Okay, so, th so this is a, the Martian Copas tour density for the, for the white Wishart. So, so this matrix here, we know how to characterize very well. And the matrix we're interested in here is actually the product, and it's a rotation invariant. It's also an invariant. It's a rotation invariant product of, um, it's a product of a rotation invariant matrix with some other matrix. Well, I mean, I write it this way. Um, it's, it's quite, a, yeah, maybe another thing that's important that most people would say the product of a matrix would be like C times W, but C times W is not symmetric, symmetrical. So for positive definite matrices, I prefer to write square root of C, W square root of C, okay? And for the eigenvalues, it doesn't matter. Well, this is a non-symmetric matrix, but it has the same eigenvalues as this guy. But for the eigenvectors, it will actually matter quite a bit whether um, the, the C is on the outside or in the inside. For instance, this is a rotation invariant matrix. This is not, this depends on the eigenvectors of, of C, okay? And I'm really rushed for time. So remember I told you that, well, we, we worked a little bit with the R transform that, that sort of is additive for a product, for sums of free matrices. Well, there's something called the S transform. And what you would have is a S, so it's evaluated say at point uh, data, no, at point X would be S, C, so there's a, there's a transform that, but for an object like this, um, for an object that's a product of a random uh, rotation invariant, a large matrix C and some other matrix, there is, there exists a function that depends on the spectrum. It's called the S If you know the S transform of C and you know the S transform of W zero, then you know the, tra the S transform of the product, the free product. And once you know the S transform, you can go from the S transform to, to, the, de to the, the Seelgers transform and to the density. And I think I should stop here. And when I'll need to use this, I'll explain a bit better how to compute this S transform. This S, S transform is, is again related to some inverse of Seelgers transform. It's a bit just slightly more complicated. But, but uh, we'll see that next time. Okay, thank you very much.
And by the way, I'll go slower the next time. This is, this is background material. Let me recall the program. Who's next? So, okay. Someone who's next should know he's next. <laughs> So let me just distribute 